Welcome to our Sunday morning worship service. Oh, we want to talk about race today, but I'm not racist, right? I mean, that's most of our responses. We think everything's okay, everybody is equal, especially in the United States of America. But if we were really to walk in our neighbor's shoes, the shoes of a person of color, a Latino, an immigrant, an African American today, would the same opportunities be available? Would we feel the same if every day it was a topic of conversation or a challenge simply because of the color of our skin or the native language that we grew up speaking? Racism takes many forms, prejudices and hates, and perhaps the most segregated hour in the work week is Sunday morning. Christ calls us to see each other as children of God, as we are for who we are made in the image of God. And it is in the power of Christ that some of our deepest hatreds, fears, and prejudices are met and healed. If any of this is hitting home for you, as it does in my own life, I invite you to stay with us as we discuss more deeply how Christ can save us from ourselves and our deepest forms of racism. Please remain standing and join with me in the call to worship found in your bulletins responsibly. In times of protest and mass shootings, public slurs and pejorative remarks, we sometimes feel helpless and overwhelmed 
even crushed in spirit. Where do we find that which can heal the ugliness of prejudice and hate? Holy Spirit, be the source of our healing that we may see in every person someone you created, someone you die for. Guide our thoughts, our reactions, and our responses. And let us not be timid to stand for truth, dignity, and value of all your children, even and especially when it means struggling with judgments and prejudices of our own. Amen. Please be seated. At this time, I'd like to invite you to sing Jesus Loves Me, This I Know, and any children or young at heart who would like to come on down to join me up front to do so now. Jesus loves me, this I know. Good morning, boys and girls. How are you? Oh, wait a minute. I see some very sleepy faces up here this morning. How are you guys? Are you awake? Uh, Kind of. Well, I'd like to play a game with you this morning. Are you ready? Everybody like to play a game? Would everybody like to play? Okay, so here's the game. We're going to play I'm thinking of an animal. I'm going to think of an animal. And then you raise your hand if you think you know what animal it is. But there's one rule. If you have brown eyes, if you have brown eyes, how many of you have brown eyes? Okay, you guys can't play my game. Okay, everybody else can play. You got green eyes like me, you got blue eyes, you can play. Are you ready? All right, so I'm thinking of an animal. I'm sorry, you have brown eyes, sorry. So, okay, so my animal is pink. And uh, yes, what do you think? This is a guy of plants or what? How'd you know it was, a, it was a flamingo? All right, let's do one more. All right, I'm thinking of an animal, and this animal is brown. And it lives in the forest. All right, has anybody got an idea? Uh, wait, 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 wait. Don't shout it out. Yes, do, wait, color, what color eyes do you have? You have blue. Yes, you can guess. Blue? Yes, how about you? Do you have blue eyes or brown eyes? Blue eyes. Okay, you can guess. A bear. It's not a bear. You, you have brown eyes. Do you have a guess? Oh, I'm sorry. Wait, you can't play. Now, wait, if you have brown eyes... I'm going to add another rule. If you have brown eyes, you can't even talk. Sorry, I don't I want to even, you can't, you can't talk either. Sorry, no, 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 no talking. Yes. A horse is not a horse. And it's, it's kind of about this tall. It lives in the woods. Yeah, wait, do you have brown eyes? No, they're close. All right, go ahead. A donkey? No. What is it? It's bigger than a squirrel. Yeah. It's a deer. You're right. Now, boys and girls... How many of you who had brown eyes thought that game wasn't very fun? Yeah. Why wasn't it fun? Why wasn't it fun? Wait, why wasn't it fun? Because you couldn't play. Because there, shh, because there was a different set of rules. Okay, girls. It was a different set of rules because you looked a little differently. Because the color of your eyes was different than your blue-eyed or green-eyed friends, right? Now, this weekend... It's a very special weekend because we remember somebody in the history and life of the church named Martin Luther King Jr. And Martin Luther King Jr. was a minister, but he also is something that I like to call a prophet. He was a person who said, you know what? As part of God's dream for all humanity, every person, no matter what they look like, no matter where they're from, what language they speak, or the color of their skin, And if you look at my stole here, what do you see? Boys and girls from from all different countries, all different ethnicities and groups of people. And he said, that's what the kingdom of God looks like, where all God's children can dream and play and work together equally in God's love. And he said, God's people, you and I, have to work really hard because sometimes... Just like the game we played this morning, sometimes people don't treat each other when there's differences by how we look or by whether or not we can walk or we're in a wheelchair or whether or not we can see. 
if our skin color is a little different or our hair is a little different, sometimes people don't treat people who are different very kindly. And God says, no, all of us are brothers and sisters to each other. And so this week, girls, this week, I want you to think about how you treat all the boys and girls in your school with love and kindness. Can you do that for me this week? Now, how many of you remembered also that this month we are giving some money to boys and girls who are hungry? Did anybody remember this week? Anybody remember? A few of you. So if you brought some coins and you're going out towards Sunday school today, remember the little church that we're going to give money this, this month to feed my starving children. So remember if you brought it to put it in there, you can go ahead and ring the little bell. And will you pray with me, boys and girls? Let us pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, boys and girls, please. Please join in singing verse two of Jesus Loves Me. Jesus loves me still today, walking with me on my way, wanting as a friend to give light and love to all who live. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. The first reading is from the book of Genesis, chapter 4, verses 2b to 16. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a tiller of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel, for his part, brought of the firstlings of his flock their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, Sin is lurking at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must master it. Cain said to his brother Abel, let us go out to the field. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What have you done? Listen, your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it will no longer yield to you its strength. You will be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Today you have driven me away from the soil, and I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and anyone who meets me may kill me. Then the Lord said to him, not so. Whoever kills Cain will suffer a sevenfold vengeance. And the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who came upon him would kill him. 
Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. The second reading is from the book of Proverbs, chapter 18, verse 14. The human spirit will endure sickness, but a broken spirit who can bear? Mother, mother, there's too many of you crying. Brother, 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 there's far too many of you dying. You know you've got to find a way to bring some love in here today. Oh. Father, Father, we don't need to escalate. You see, war is not the answer, for only love can conquer hate. You know you've got to find a way to bring some love in here today. Oh. Picket lines and picket signs Don't punish me with brutality Talk to me so you can see Oh, what's going on? What's going on? Yeah, what's going on?
Will you please join with me? And as we pray today, I'll also add in some of the words of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as part of the prayer in his letter from Birmingham Prison. Let us pray. Am I my brother's keeper? Cain asks God. When God asked him, where is your brother Abel? He knows the answer to the question God asks. And so does God. And so do we if we follow the resurrected one from Nazareth. We are our brother and sister's keeper. Everyone, every man, woman, and child is our neighbor. Every person labeled them or other or those folks are blessings for whom Christ's image has been made and whom Jesus has hung on the cross for. No less, not even an ounce, less loved, less worthy to share the same rights and privileges of all God's children. And from the Reverend Doctor who said, when you are harried day and night haunted by the fact that you are a Negro, living constantly at a tiptoe stance and never quite knowing what to expect, and plagued with inner fears and outer resentments, you are forever fighting a degenerating sense of nobodiness. And then you will understand why it is difficult to wait. And there comes a time the cup of endurance runs over, and men are no longer willing to be plunged into the abyss of despair. As St. Thomas Aquinas wrote, an unjust law is a human law that is not rooted in eternal law and natural law, but any law that uplifts human personality is just. Just as any law that degrades human personality is unjust. Now I am convinced, after all of our work, that the great stumbling block in his stride towards freedom is not white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klaner, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of justice, and who says constantly, I agree with the goal you seek, but cannot agree with your methods of direct action, and who paternalistically believes he can set the timetable for another man's freedom, and lives in the mystical concept of time, who advises the Negro to wait for a more convenient season. For the dream that all your children might recognize you and one another equally. That is yet to be a reality, we pray this day. Amen. Last week we talked about confession. Being honest with each other, being honest with ourselves, being honest before God. And today I will confess to you one of my most painful memories as a boy. We were driving down the interstate in Cleveland. Where we were going, I don't know. Why we were going there, I have no idea. What I do remember is that as I was sitting in between my dad who was driving and my uncle who was in the passenger seat of the cab of that truck, we were going alongside of a funeral procession of large one, 40 or 50 cars. And I remember my uncle drawing my attention, knocking on the glass as if we were at the circus or some other event of curiosity. And I remember him telling my father to lay down some horn. As he looked at the people of the cars we passed, pointing to the hearse of the deceased and smiling, and giving a thumbs up and telling my father, there's one more we won't have to worry about. And I remember seeing the mother or grandmother of that black 
man or woman or white, I don't know who the person in the casket was. All I know is it's an African-American procession of grief, and as she was wiping her tears, looking into the face, the smiling, gloating face of my uncle, mocking her grief. And if there's any place in the planet I could have been instead of that truck, I would have been there. And as I look back on it now 35, 40 years later, and I think of that poor woman, of all those people who saw my uncle's actions, and I think about the moment, the raw moment of grief and pain as I bury people I love and hold on to in this earthly life. And I imagine what it must have felt like. I can't begin to imagine what it must have felt like. Her pain, her anger, her disbelief that any human being could be so cruel, so unforgiving and merciless to a stranger he'd never met because of the color of the tone of her skin. Where is your brother Abel, Cain? I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? I tell myself I'm not a racist. That I care about all people that I seek to work for justice. But I know that I've been influenced by some of the things of my family, positively and negatively, some of the overt racism, whether from my uncle or my father. Be careful of the things you say in front of your children, the things that they absorb and see and normalize because of our behaviors as adults. But I also remember in my ignorance, because I don't think about when I walk into a store, I often don't have people look at me with suspicion or ask me to leave, as my friends of color did in the town I grew up with. I remember going to seminary and very proudly wearing a shirt that said, God is colorblind with red and orange and black and white. And a friend of mine who was African-American, she said to me, why are you wearing that shirt? I said, because I care about race relations and racial justice. She said, do you understand what that shirt says to me? It says that God does not see the diversity and beauty in me being black or an Asian person being Asian, or a Hispanic person being Hispanic, or a white person being white, that our differences are not beautiful things, that our culture is not important, God-given gifts. Instead, it's saying that God doesn't notice the differences that we have. In fact, that we all just have this one blended normalcy despite our differences, as if they don't exist at all. But if you stand in the world that I stand in every day, Scott, if you walk in my shoes and you see one in every three of your boyfriends don't make it to their 18th birthday, four out of every 10 people of color are imprisoned before their 18th birthday, and you say, God is colorblind, it sends me a message that God doesn't care about a world that still is not equal. And I cannot accept, as I read scripture, that God doesn't care. And I thought, wow, do I have a lot to learn about what it is to walk in my brother or sister's shoes. I might not see myself as overtly racist, but I may have no idea what it is to live in the shoes of a minority and the daily struggle it is to not know how you're received just by the color of your skin rather than the character, as Martin Luther King Jr. said, 
of his soul. As Cain is met by God in the book of Genesis, God asks him, where are your brother, Abel? And it's a rhetorical question. He doesn't need an answer from Cain to know what Cain has done. And Cain says that phrase that I've said again and again, am I my brother's keeper? The word keeper in Hebrew is shamar, shamar. That word means protector, guardian, retainer. One who treasures and values deeply and intrinsically the object over which it is to keep. Am I my brother's guardian? He says, Cain, your brother's blood cries out to me from the very soil over what you've done. Am I my brother's keeper? As I hear reports of routine stops like the one in 2014 when Eric Gardner was stopped for selling single loose cigarettes without tax stamps. He had been arrested in the past for marijuana possession. It's on the same street corner he had been almost every day for years on end. And when he that day said, please, don't bust my chops for this. You guys have better things to do. Police officer confronted him, called in backup, and in moments the scene escalated and six officers were standing on him, or giving him a chokehold and putting him to the ground. And he said, and you remember this news story, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. And moments later, the ambulance is taken to the hospital. He's pronounced dead. Coroner's report is from neck and back injuries suffered during excessive use of force in his arrest. Am I my brother's keeper? Am I my brother's keeper when in Flint, Michigan, residents are asking for two years, there's something wrong with our water. Our children are getting sick. There are E. coli breakouts and lead poisoning. And the disparity when they, the people, the poor people of Flint are asking city and state officials to look into it. The EPA has found 134 different contaminated sites on the Flint River as they're redirecting their water supply. And General Motors petitions the governor and says, this water is corroding our vehicles. We want to hook up to another city from Lake Huron and boom, they get it. Two months before the poor residents of Flint and all those children and men and women are exposed to lead poisoning, contaminants 13,000 times greater than the EPA recommends for drinking water. Am I my brother's keeper? Am I my brother's keeper when in Standing Rock the residents ask and plead for the governor to step in? When the DPA pipeline is run, being proposed through their water lands, just the same way that the people of D Bismarck, North Dakota, said, please don't build this pipeline through our backyards, and the pipeline was moved 100 miles. But when it's on the reservation land, well, we're going to fight for it because that's ah, a reservation. And if we want it, we can take it, right? Am I my brother's keeper? We are our brother's keeper. We are called to guard and protect, to care for one another. Jesus says this to his disciples again and again as he helps them or forces them to struggle with a view of our neighbors that is different than the people in the everyday synagogues were prepared to accept. Why are you eating with those tax collectors? Why are you telling us a parable about those half-breed Samaritans? A good Samaritan? There's no such thing. It's an oxymoron as a term. 
Why are you going to the leper outcast outposts of society and embracing those people who are clearly judged by God as less than? Even his own disciples struggled with the way Jesus pushed the barriers and said, do you want to know what your neighbor looks like? Who is my neighbor? The other side of the tracks is your neighbor. Behind the bars of the prison is your neighbor. The addict in the alley in the street who is struggling with his addiction and has run away from home is your neighbor. I wonder if Jesus were here today doing a heck of a lot better speaking to us than I am, and he would ask as we would sit with Jesus at a table for coffee or something, and Jesus would ask, who is your neighbor? Who would he introduce you to today? And who would he introduce me to? Who is it that if they sat around the table would make you a little bit repulsed if you were honest with yourself? Make you a little bit suspicious if you were honest with yourself? Would it be an Arab Muslim neighbor? A skinhead? A fundamentalist? A feminist? Would it be a felon? Or perhaps somebody who has a vastly polar different political opinion than yourself? Who is it that we struggle with in our prejudices and judgments that somehow doesn't qualify to be our neighbor? As I struggle with Growing up, my family members, some of the people I love most, my grandfather, my father, my uncle, and the things I witnessed them say or do, particularly at moments that sometimes were great joys in my life. I've told many of you the story of probably one of the greatest moments of my young life when my school team uh, went undefeated and won our basketball championship. And, the only African-American boy in the school, my friend Scott, was on my team, and he had had a struggle at the beginning of the game, and I remember getting in the truck again between my grandfather and my dad, and the first words from my grandfather's mouth were, that darn, and he used a word for Scott that I'd never heard anybody use for any person of color ever. He said, he nearly lost you the game. And all I could, I don't even remember if I said these words, but I, I thought to myself, and I hope I said them, but I don't think I had the courage to say them because I was so struck, so confused that my grandfather would say such a hateful thing. I just thought, he's my friend. How can you call him something so ugly? He's my friend. Many of you know I, I love movies, and I recall the movie Dances with Wolves. In a very poignant uh, putting together of scenes where in the one scene you have Kevin Costner and the Sioux that he has befriended and become a part of the community with, and they go on a hunt for buffalo. And it's dangerous. It's an adrenaline rush. And yet when the buffalo is killed, the community rejoices and celebrates, and it's a communal event of survival, of culture, of being part of the people. And then there's a scene just minutes later, although I know it's a slog, long movie, where they come across the crest and the fur traders have been through, and the buffalo have been butchered just for their hides, and the carcasses are left rotting. And as I witness a scene like that, I think there's this tremendous guilt that I share. My European ancestors, I think, how could any group of people do such a violent thing for their greed, affecting a whole culture of people and disrupting a whole way of life without a, without a thought about it, 
as they line their pockets. But then the movie, in fairness, takes another angle as it shows Sioux uh, violence with another Native American tribe killing one another for no apparent reason other than their territory is threatened. And you see and begin to think about the differences that we have and because of those differences, what we are willing to do to one another as human beings in violence for our own gain. That we create these systems of winners and losers. And again and again, from Old Testament to New, our story, our Christian narrative is enough. Break the cycle of violence. Break the cycle of other. See your brother and sister inherently as the God-created child of the living God, child of light that they are. We have work to do in that endeavor. But most crushing, I think, for me this past week, as I thought about the preacher king and how sometimes we narrow it down to a Sunday in the year, an ongoing struggle for racial justice. I was again playing basketball with the boys at the Warrenville Center Correctional Facility. And afterwards, we sat, after we play, we sit, sit around and I bring some snacks and we're sharing food. It's, it's similar to the moment when the guys are tarring the roof in Shawshank for me. And these kids, black, white, Hispanic, who have just been having fun out there, forgetting for a moment the world outside and what has brought them in. And they share with me, this one kid, 16 years old, seven times he's been in prison. Another kid. When I ask him, what should we pray for? My good friend who was shot in the chest yesterday. And he shows me his own gunshot wounds. 15 years old. And I think to myself, there has to be better answers. What will these kids go home to? A few of them get in trouble again because what's here is better than what they go home to. How can that be? And for the rest, the label of con, of felon, how will they ever get out from underneath that and live any kind of life with dignity when even after they've paid their penance behind bars, what is there for them to go to? There is work to be done, my brothers and sisters. If the dream of white children and black children and Hispanic children playing together, working together, praying together is to become a reality. And as the preacher king said in a way that haunts me, moderate, middle class white folk, because they're not unaffected, by, because they're not affected by it, can't say everything's better now. Because we're not there, not by a long shot. If we are follow Jesus of Nazareth to the places he would go, to care for all those he would care for, and the realization that almost all of his time was spent outside of houses of worship, where will God send you and I? to help and find and stand with brothers and sisters who don't yet have the equality that you and I daily enjoy. Until they do, we have work to do. Amen.
Today, <clears throat> there is a lot of folks I would ask you to keep in your thoughts and prayers. <clears throat> We've had many, many people hospitalized this week. And a few that are back with us after being hospitalized. Sandy Gales, we want to be continuing prayers for her healing after surgery. For Ann Albert, who continues to battle pneumonia. For the family of Montre Dunham, who died of pneumonia last week. For the Osborne family, as Jan and Dave and Lexi be moving southeast to Pennsylvania this week. And as they remember and grieve Dan, who died this fall and whose services were here yesterday. Prayers and blessing for them. They leave on Tuesday. They are not here, I don't believe, Jan or Dave. Not here today. Please let them know your love for them before they go. For Mary Jo Hankel, who's been hospitalized this past week. For Ken Clintworth, who is struggling again with his health and his heart down in Florida. For Margaret Craig, who also is struggling after a fall and recovery. For Sam McHugh, who is at Mayo Clinic for a major and radical surgery this coming Monday. For Amanda Mirdick, newer member of our church choir, who is also having major surgery tomorrow for tumor removal. And for Gail Jurowski, who also had surgery this past week. Please keep them in your thoughts, your prayers, not only today, but throughout your week, and for any others that you're thinking of, as I list those names. Will you please join me in a moment of silent prayer, and then let us pray together. Let us pray. God, whether it's a joke that we overhear at the workplace or at school or at the dinner table, at the expense of another's race or ethnicity, or it's an unjust law or an inequality or prejudiced remark, when we ask, am I my brother's keeper, the answer is yes, and again, yes, you're darn right we are. To guard and protect one another and to treat each other with dignity, with respect, and with the God-given love that we daily strive and seek, that we might give it to one another. Help us Meet us in our places of division so that we can see one another as you see us. Meet us in our places of distrust and fear that we might sit down at the table together and hear one another and interact with our neighbors instead of keeping them at arm's length so that in knowing one another we may find our brother and sister in ways that are unexpected and help us to learn and grow about what it means to be a human being created in your image. Cast out all fear and for the scars we carry and for the places that we have either been willing or unwilling participants, use them within us to change us to be new creations for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, we pray these things, that all might find grace, glory, salvation, and love in your kingdom. Amen. As we offer ourselves this week, again, a reminder for the Peace March today,
Or if you want to join me for some basketball on a Thursday night, come see me afterwards um, at the Warrenville Center. We are collecting items for the boys and girls there, ages 13 to 18, uh, hygienic items, clothing. Um, so please, if you are able, uh, donate some of those goods as part of your offering to God. I invite the ushers to please come forward for this morning's offering. You're broken down and tired of living life on the merry-go-round. And you can't find the fighter, but I see it in you, so we gon' walk it out. Move mountains, we gon' walk it out and move.
God, today we open ourselves to offer those places within us that have not been able to see or hear our brothers or sisters equally. For the times when our own stereotypes or prejudices have influenced how we have acted or spoken. We offer them here to ask you in your Holy Spirit to change us that we might see and hear and live differently that all our brothers and sisters might not only be welcomed but cared for in the land of the free and the home of the brave as equals. Use these gifts both in these trays and in these seats to build a kingdom without end in the love of Christ, our Lord, our Savior, our God. Amen. I invite you to remain standing as we sing our closing hymn today. It is the hymn that Martin Luther King Jr. asked his friend to sing the day he was shot as he was dying as his last request. I hope it gives a new meaning as we envision his life work and his dying that his community hear this word, these words, as we sing them again here today. If you're visiting with us today at First Congregational United Church of Christ, one of our closing traditions is to say we are joined together by the Spirit of God. What happens to one of us happens to all of us. And so in solidarity of the journey we travel in this life in faith, let us join hands as we sing our closing benediction ancient words. I fear some of us, when we think about stereotypes and prejudice, or see some of the hatred in our world, we say, it's too big for me alone. I'm just one person. What can I do? 
And you may be right, alone there may not be much. But you don't leave these doors alone. You have a great, big, and awesome God that goes with you. You're never alone. And with the power of the living God, may you and I be anointed for the work of being ambassadors of God's love. Wherever our feet take us, wherever our voice is heard, let us settle for nothing less. Go and work to being a disciple and a builder of Christ's kingdom. Go in peace. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. Please make sure you come next week for the congregational meeting and to meet our new, hopefully, associate pastor. In the meantime, come on up and join us in our postlude. Beautiful day. a whole day since I stopped so you could hold me this child that waits strong in the faith Lord you are the refuge that I can't wait to get to cause I can't let a day go can't let a day go by without thanking you for the joy that you bring to my life and ooh there's something about the way It's a love so true, I can never get enough of you. This feeling can't be wrong. I'm about to get my worship on. Take me away. It's a beautiful day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a beautiful day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When trouble seems to rain on my dreams, it's not a big, not a big deal. Let it wash all the bugs on my windshield Cause you're showing me And you are free And you're still the refuge That I've just got to get to So I won't let a day go Won't let a day go by So put the drop top down Turn it out cause I'm ready to fly And ooh, there's something about the way your sun shines on my face It's a love so true I can never get enough of you This feeling can't be wrong I'm about to get my worship on Take me away It's a beautiful day It's a beautiful day Yeah, yeah, yeah I've got no need to worry I've got no room for doubt no matter what's coming at me, you'll always be the beautiful I sing about. There ain't no limitations to your amazing grace, your amazing grace. There's something about the way your love shines on my face. Oh no, I can never get enough of you. This feeling can't be wrong. I'm about to get my worship on. I'm about to sing a brand new song. Yeah, I'm about to get my worship on. Take me away. It's on a beautiful day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a beautiful day. Thank you so much. Have a great week.